Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the first in NASA's seminar series on the Asteroid Grand Challenge. My name is Yvonne Pendleton, and I'm the director at NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. We are a virtual institute that connects researchers across the country and with our international partners in the study of the moon, near-Earth asteroids, and the moons of Mars. Today, we're going to be bringing you uh, the first in this seminar series using our exploration uh, research tools, uh, specifically the Adobe Connect system. And you are connected in in a way that will allow you to ask questions using the chat box on your computer. We will start our seminars in just a moment. I want to first tell you that because of the severe weather on the East Coast, we have had to reverse the order of our first two talks. So you will be able to hear Lindley Johnson scheduled for today's talk on February 28th. The seminar series will run for, for the next several months. We hope to have two seminars each month, and they will be on the Friday uh, of the week. And you can see the agenda and the archive talks on our website. The website can be found at survey.nasa.gov. Survey is S S E R V as in Virtual Institute. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, uh, a very renowned planetary scientist, Dr. David Morrison. Uh, David is a member of the staff here at NASA Ames Research Center, which is where the central office for Survey is located. He is also the senior scientist on the survey staff. He is our expert, our resident expert <clears throat> in near-Earth asteroids, and so it's very fitting that he would give the kickoff talk today, and he will be giving you a historical perspective on the asteroid impact hazard. David has published over 150 papers and is the author or co-author of at least 12 textbooks and other books. Uh, he is perhaps best known for, in recent times, for his work on the near-Earth asteroids and bringing the idea of the um, potential hazards and what we can do about it to the public. He's an excellent uh, communicator and public speaker, and it is my pleasure to introduce him to you today. Thank you very much for joining us, David. Thank you, Yvonne, and, uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, I am assuming that there are people who will watch this on tape since it will be archived and should be available just a couple of hours after the talk, but I'm very glad to have all of you who are online as well. The impact hazard is now quite familiar. Uh, it's in cartoons. It's on the newspapers. People refer to, uh, to things like a... a uh, problem with the financial system as an asteroid. Uh, so now people realize that asteroids do hit the Earth and they could do damage. But that realization only goes back about 25 or 30 years. NASA has recognized it very specifically in the Grand Challenge. The Grand Challenge uh, was issued last spring and it says that we, the people of Earth, should find all objects capable of threatening human populations and determine how to deal with them. The Grand Challenge Office at NASA Headquarters is one of the sponsors of these talks, and I will be talking about studying near-Earth asteroids in the context of our ultimate need to defend the Earth against impacts. Let me say at the beginning, if anyone is, is concerned, we know of no near-Earth asteroid that's on a collision course with Earth. But we are looking, and it is entirely probable that over the next decades we will find such asteroids and have to learn how to deal with them. Um, just to go back in history, uh, here are a few quotes. I won't read them all, but they are amusing. Um, there's the one from Laplace that says, men should be free of fear because the probability of a comet striking the Earth within the span of human lifetime is slim, even though the probability of such an impact occurring in the course of centuries is very great. Now, I may not have the probabilities right, but you know that's where we are now. We don't know of any object going to hit us, but we do anticipate that it will happen. Um, Lord Byron 
had a wonderful thing. At least I think it's wonderful. It says, who knows whether when a comet shall approach the globe to destroy it, as it often has been and will be destroyed, men will not tear rocks from their foundations by means of steam and hurl mountains, as the giants are said to have done against the flaming mass. So uh, we who study near-Earth asteroids, I guess, are the titans who will fight for our planet against dangers from heaven. And finally, uh, one from George Brown, who was a congressman who was very uh, influential in the early interest of, uh, of, in NEOs. And he said that, uh, you got it here, someday in the future, we will discover well, in, if someday in the future, we discover well in advance that an asteroid that is big enough to cause a mass extinction is going to hit the Earth, and then we alter the course of that asteroid so it does not hit us, it will be one of the most important accomplishments in all of history. And he was an advocate in the U.S. Congress uh, for doing just that. Now, the public had a real wake-up call, as you all know, and it's fitting to be talking about today. One year ago tomorrow was the appearance over Russia, over the Ural area, of the Chelyabinsk meteor, the first really bright impact uh, exploded in the atmosphere and showered stones on the ground, set up a, a shock wave that did quite a lot of damage. And you've all seen the pictures. Uh, here are some stills of the object coming in. It was a little after dawn in the Chelyabinsk region of the Ural Mountains. It was photographed by many stationary cameras and dash cams, the, uh, the cameras that people had in their cars that, that, to protect against uh, bad claims for, for auto accidents. Uh, but it turned out to be a very good way to look at an incoming object. And the city of Chelyabinsk, which was not directly under the impact, but was the, the main area there affected by it, experienced thousands and thousands of blown out windows, uh, damaged structures, uh, about 1,500 people uh, were hurt, but there were no fatalities. And this explosion rained rocks on the ground, thousands upon thousands of them, uh, which landing on snow were relatively easy to be recovered. And so for the week until the next snowfall took place, a lot of people, a lot of kids went out looking for these little black rocks. The biggest piece landed in a lake very good aim right in the middle of the lake, and uh, that piece was not recovered until just a few months ago, uh, and it was uh, a fair fraction of a ton, uh, but most of the impact pieces are just, just little black rocks, such as you see here. Also, uh, people generally have been aware of the Tunguska impact in 1908, which also took place in, in Russia. Russia seems to have been the target object for incoming objects. That was substantially larger than the Chelyabinsk meteor. It also was an airburst, destroyed about 1,000 square kilometers of forest, um, essentially uh, was equivalent to a large nuclear bomb, and if it came over a city, it could have wiped out that city. Uh, Tunguska was an impact with a small stony asteroid about 40 meters in diameter. Chelyabinsk was half that size, 20 meters, and so that means an order of magnitude difference in the energy in the two cases. Well, there are lots of reasons to care about NEAs. NEA is near-Earth asteroid, uh, NEO is near-Earth object, and for our purposes, they tend to be used interchangeably because the near-Earth objects that threaten impacts with Earth are, in fact, asteroids, stony or metallic objects in the solar system. Um, the NEAs represent a largely unexplored component of the solar system, so they're of great interest to scientists. Um, they are probably going to be our stepping stones to Mars. That is, we will go to asteroids en route to Mars. And this was the uh, challenge given to NASA by the president three years ago, that we take human exploration as far as near-Earth asteroids with the ultimate goal of Mars. Much of the emphasis in what I'm saying today is on defending our planet. Uh, clearly, NEAs are the objects that are most likely to collide with Earth. And they also constitute the most accessible objects in translunar space, so that if we ever have a robust economy of spaceflight and use resources in space, probably they will come from the near-Earth asteroids. 
And finally, people are just aware, and they're especially aware since Chelyabinsk a year ago. And uh, what we are doing with NEA is are of interest to the president, to the Congress, to the public, uh, in the U.S. and worldwide. So let me think a little bit more about the history. The Tunguska impact in 1908 was the first and until recently the only example of a cosmic impact that had been witnessed by people and recorded. Uh, there are plenty of craters from previous impacts, but that one is stuck in people's minds as the one example of the kind of dangerous impact that could take place. In 1967, a very clever group of students at MIT actually produced a study they called Project Icarus, which for the first time did a kind of quantitative estimate of what it would take to deflect a near-Earth asteroid, specifically Icarus, if it had been headed for the Earth to hit in 1969, what could they have done? And it's a very sharp study. Um, then in 1980, and we're getting down to my memory, uh, the discovery that the end Cretaceous mass extinction was due to an impact has impressed itself on everyone in the world. If you, you say dinosaur and asteroid, they come right together. It was an asteroid that led to the... Uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs. Astronomers had been finding near-Earth asteroids photographically with small telescopes and, uh, and moderately long exposure images, but in 1989 it was done electronically for the first time. Tom Garrels in Arizona with his Space Watch program used CCD cameras. In that case, not only is it much easier to take the photo, but it is much easier to do the computer analysis uh, to find the positions and get the orbit. So everything that we have done in searching for near-Earth asteroids in the last 20 years uses that technology that wasn't created until 1989. In 1990, the U.S. Congress formally asked NASA uh, to study the impact threat, and that is the prelude to what I'm going to be talking about now. Also, the public was interested. There was a Newsweek cover story, Doomsday Science, Comets and Asteroids and How the World Might End perhaps a little overdramatic, uh, but it caught our attention. And there was a cover story in The Economist also, The Threat from Space. So by the early 1990s, there was beginning to be interest both in government and in the public of this fact that we were vulnerable, that we could be hit by asteroids. Now, for those of us involved, uh, it, uh, it wasn't obvious to most people. After all, no one has ever, at least then, no one had ever seen an impact. Uh, no one had ever been killed by an impact. It's something that was totally unfamiliar, except for the historic example of Tunguska. And we had what we called the giggle factor to deal with. Uh, you would get up and talk about uh, danger from asteroids hitting the Earth, and people would say, oh, yeah, ha, ha, ha. Or maybe this was just astronomers trying to make this up so that they can get more money for their telescopes. And so we, we had to overcome it. And one of the first steps was this congressional requested NASA workshop in 1992, which led to what is called the Space Guard Survey. And that was the first place we, we actually asked ourselves what is the threshold in size for an impact that could be globally catastrophic, what would be locally catastrophic. We decided to focus and or recommend to NASA that we focus on the objects that would be large enough to do a, a to create a global disaster, not a mass extinction, but a global disaster. And so we recommended that we begin to survey for asteroids with the emphasis on those larger than one kilometer in diameter. Um, the lar large cosmic impacts then uh, are the most catastrophic natural events we know of. Um, they're also the only natural hazard that we believe we could truly eliminate and protect ourselves against. It's hard to imagine that anyone will ever be able to stop an earthquake or plug a volcano that was going to erupt or even slow down a hurricane. There, our protection is just to, uh, to give warnings, to build stronger buildings and so on. But if we find an asteroid, an impact trajectory toward Earth with enough time, then we do have the technology, at least in principle, to deflect it so it doesn't hit at all. We haven't just mitigated 
the problem by making it less, we actually could eliminate it. The basic motivation for the Space Guard survey is public safety. There are good science that can come out of it, and we want to do good science, but it is protecting the Earth against a possibly catastrophic impact that is the fundamental objective. Now, to, to do this, you have to think about what size object does what kind of damage. And so one of the plots that uh, Clark Chapman and I first put together that was in uh, that first Space Guard report is one that tries to estimate the frequency of impact for the whole Earth uh, as a function of the size or more naturally of the energy, the TNT equivalent yield of the impact. And the units are megatons, the same units that are used to describe explosions of nuclear weapons. There are a number of ways of getting at this, and, and what I'm showing you here is perhaps not the, the historically correct way, but it's a good way of thinking of it. We know there were impacts like Kunguska or like the end Cretaceous impact 65 million years ago. Obviously, we did not know how frequently those took place because we only had one example. What we do know about frequency is for small objects that don't make it to the ground, that explode in the upper atmosphere, and they can be uh, with energies uh, as big as, uh, as the Chelyabinsk, for instance. These are detected from down-looking surveillance satellites in space. We didn't have all that data at the time, but that gives you a point up there, that there is a, an explosion roughly of the energy of an atom bomb that takes place about once per year. How do we get the slope of this curve? Well, one of the ways is simply to count craters on the moon. If you look at the lunar maria, where the craters have not been erased and are far enough apart to count, you can measure them as a function of size and obtain this slope. And then you can read off where the other objects fit. Um, Tunguska, for instance, looks like it must be something that should happen once every couple of centuries. The global catastrophe, the one kilometer or larger impactor, is something that might happen once in a million years, and this would tell you that the KT, that is the end Cretaceous impact, the mass extinction impact, might come at intervals of roughly 100 million years. Now, today, this kind of curve is much more precise, and it's based primarily on the observations we make of the near-Earth asteroids. We have discovered some 10,000 of them, and we can do the statistics on the orbits to yield uh, a plot like this where all those little round dots are actually data, and they're data based on the asteroid population that we study. Al Harris in this series will be talking in some detail about how we determine populations, uh, but it still follows the same basic curve that we first wrote down about 25 years ago. What is the distribution of the hazard? That is, if we take that curve, that frequency curve, and associate with each size object the damage it could do or the fatalities it could cause, you can then look at what is the area you should focus on first, what size. And this plot from a 2003 uh, NASA report shows that when we started at least, there was a real concentration of danger around one, two, three kilometer objects. Um, below that, the dangers are not global. You have to be fairly near the point of impact to be hurt. Above that, you can damage agriculture on a worldwide basis, cause mass starvation, um, things that we sometimes even call the civilization-threatening impact. So the Space Guard survey focused on that peak a, at what's left of the hazard, having discovered 95% of those, that peak would go way down. And now there actually is a more flat distribution. There can some concern about objects that we haven't yet discovered at maybe two kilometers diameter, but there's also increasing focus on the objects of a few hundred meters size because there are so many more of them. In communicating with the public, we use the Torino hazard scale, uh, which was named Torino because it 
was put together and proposed at a scientific meeting in, in Turin, in Italy. And that is a color-coded picture that gives some sense of the risk or danger on a scale of 1 to 10. Now, I know today color-coded charts like this have become a little passe. Uh, but the idea was to try to provide some single-dimensional measure to give some idea of how important these are. So most asteroids are in the, the white area. Uh, a few have been discovered that crept up into one and even two, which means that they had some small probability of hitting in the future, but a definite identified risk. And in that case, the scientists would focus more attention on improving the orbits of objects. And, and we never had to get up into the orange and red scale. The Palermo scale is another version that uh, came up in another meeting in Italy, in Palermo, in 2001. And uh, that is used more frequently by the astronomers because a two-dimensional scale, uh, not one-dimensional, that takes into account not only the size of the potential impact, but the time uh, that we have to prepare for it. What are these near-Earth asteroids? Well, we visited two of them in detail with spacecraft. Uh, not flybys, but actually orbiting and landing. The first was the NASA mission near Shoemaker to Eros, which is one of the largest of the near-Earth asteroids. It landed on the surface at the end of its orbiting mission in 2001. The second was the Japanese mission, Hayabusa, to a smaller near-Earth object, Itokawa. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen this classic view of it. And that indeed involved landing in uh, 2005 briefly to pick up samples and brought those samples back to the Earth with a spectacular re-entry to the Earth atmosphere on, uh, in, in 2010. Uh, didn't bring back much. It was about a thousand little tiny particles, but it was enough to give us a chemical analysis of what Itakawa is made of. And you may recall that although it isn't a near-Earth asteroid, uh, Comet Temple 1 was the target of a NASA mission called Deep Impact, uh, which smashed at high velocity into it. And that is very important as we think about the context of how we defend ourselves against an asteroid threat. Now, in 1991, uh, the Congress specifically passed legislation as part of the NASA authorization and said it's imperative that the detection rate of Earth-crossing asteroids should be increased. And the means to destroy or alter the orbits should be studied. The first time any official government organization said that this was important and we should do something about it. And I, I very much like what they wrote. The chances of the Earth being struck by a large asteroid are extremely small, but because of the consequences of such collision, they're extremely large. The committee believes it's only prudent to assess the nature of the threat and prepare to deal with it. Very much a prelude to the language of the Grand Challenge. And for those of you who are, are coming in later, let me remind you that uh, we're happy to take your questions. We'll answer them in a few minutes. Uh, type them into the, uh, the chat box area on your computer, and uh, we're starting to select those. Well, how do we protect ourselves? Well, you have to find them first. Uh, if you haven't gotten a survey and found the near-Earth objects that might hit you, then all the rest of this is irrelevant and we would be as unprepared for an impact as the dinosaurs were. So, the first task is to find potentially hazardous asteroids. The second task is to find the asteroids and calculate their orbits. This means you don't just need a discovery observation. You need a series of observations to allow you to secure the orbit and predict its future position. And then the third, just to emphasize again, find the asteroids, calculate their orbits long before they hit. The objective is to give decades of warning, if possible, of a future impact. Now, there are three ways of looking at this. Uh, pardon, excuse me, let me say something about this. The, uh, in 2008, the Congress specifically mandated that NASA go to smaller objects. We'd originally focused on objects a kilometer or larger. They said, let's bring the threshold down to 140 meters. 
And that, of course, is, is what we look at now as one of the objectives of these surveys. And also, the question would always been asked among astronomers, slightly facetious, if I find an asteroid on an impact course to Earth, who do I call? Well, that was defined at least in the U.S. You call Lindley Johnson at NASA headquarters, he takes it to the NASA administrator, and the NASA administrator takes it to the White House uh, science advisor. And NASA is given the primary responsibility in the U.S. for discovery, tracking, and characterization, but we are to work with FEMA in case we're dealing with the response to an actual impact, uh, with the Department of Defense in case it's necessary to shoot one down, and, of course, with the broader international community. Um, where am I? So, let me talk about this in terms of these three different perspectives. The first perspective is assessing the hazard. That's what Congress called for back in 1991. It's only prudent to assess the nature of the threat. That's really a scientific uh, question. You can do it by, by sampling. You don't have to find uh, all of them. You simply need to be able to fill in an understanding of how frequently they hit. And so it's a great thing to do, but note that statistical studies that tell us how to assess the hazard do not in themselves reduce the hazard. So that brings us to the second step, which is to mitigate the hazard, that is to actually do something about it. Um, the public and decision makers are interested in warning and protection. The public policy goal then is not to refine the estimate of risk, but to identify the next impactor and do something about it. And this change was reflected in the congressional language uh, of the, the second uh, congressional action. It didn't say we were supposed to assess the risk. It said we're to detect, track, catalog, and characterize specific NEOs that might be a risk. And so the surveys that have taken place, like Space Guard, are not just to improve our understanding of the risk. We are to find every object one by one and check it out. The objective is increased public safety. Improved scientific understanding will happen, but that's not the primary purpose. And then more recently, we thought about a third perspective, because when you talk to people, logically enough, they really aren't especially interested in an impact that might, might take place a century, say, in the future. They are focused in what will happen now to us. And so instead of looking always for the biggest and most dangerous object, we want to find the nearest one. What is the soonest thing that's going to hit, and what can we do about it? Um, this turns our attention to smaller asteroids, which are harder to detect. And just for context, the diameter of the Chelyabinsk asteroid was about 20 meters, Tunguska about 40 meters. So that is the range of the most frequent impacts because those in there are, in fact, many more small objects. So it needs to, leads to a different approach to surveying where we don't just try to find all of them and look for the big ones especially, but where we really focus on, on finding small objects, even though we might not be able to give more than a few days warning. Um, the Space Guard survey I have mentioned several times. The name, by the way, comes from a novel by Arthur C. Clarke, and he was happy to let us use it for this survey. And that was designed to find essentially all, it was formulated as 90% of the NEAs larger than one kilometer. <clears throat> it has been tremendously successful. Uh, most of the asteroids have been discovered by just uh, four small telescopes, relatively small, one meter. Um, and of course, the, the goal is not just to discover them, but to gain orbits so we actually know where they'll be in the future. Um, the survey has been supported almost entirely by NASA. It's been carried out by several U.S. telescopes. And by now, we have achieved the goal and overachieved it. The goal was to find 90% of the asteroids larger than one kilometer. We've now found 94 or 95%.
So we have a good idea about the big ones, and again, I'm very glad to tell you that not one of these larger asteroids discovered by Space Card is on a collision course with Earth. This is a plot showing the discovery. You notice there is an inflection in 1998 where the rate of discovery has shot up. That, of course, represents the actual point at which the Space Guard survey started, in which NASA paid for it. Uh, you have to have money in order to carry out a survey like this. The red part uh, is the ones larger than one kilometer. And you notice it flattens out. We aren't discovering as many of them as we were initially. And that's simply a question of completeness. As we near 100%, that we find that each year we find almost no new ones. The blue is all NEAs. So the red, there are just about between 950 and 1,000. <clears throat> and the blue shows that we're up to 10,000 NEAs. An amazing change from the the 1980s when we could only 20, 30 known, we now have 10,000. We understand the whole population much better. Now the other way to look at it is not numbers but completeness. That is how much have we found relative to what's out there. This chart says we have 94% of those larger than one kilometer. <coughs> In the 300, 500 kilometer range, 60% down in that 140 meter range that the Congress has asked for, only 15 percent. Down at Tunguska, less than 1 percent. There are a million near-Earth asteroids out there in these small sizes that could hit the Earth. And our percentage completeness is rather low. If we wanted to focus on finding the smaller objects, then we would need new surveys much deeper and incidentally, much more expensive. These next generation surveys could be done from the ground, or from Earth orbit, or from deep space. And there are arguments for each. <coughs> the ground-based surveys are, are fairly straightforward if you have a much bigger telescope. And one is being built, the LSST, the Large Synap Synoptic Survey Telescope. The, um, from Earth orbit, there is a proposal called NEOCAM to do an infrared survey, uh, which would be able to, to find lots of objects, increase our impact, our, our discovery rate by a factor of 10 at least. If we took the telescope away from the Earth and put it in a heliocentric orbit, an inner heliocentric orbit, it can sweep around faster and find objects more quickly. So if we were really seriously in a hurry to find another 100,000 asteroids or 200,000 asteroids, probably the heliocentric space IR survey would be the most effective. Um, in any of these, uh, you get what you pay for. And if you want to find hundreds of thousands of more near asteroids, you're going to have to pay for it uh, in much more than we're spending now. One of the challenges from Congress has been not just to find them, but to characterize them. <clears throat> First, characterize their orbits, then try to measure their size, and then go to these other things to find out what the, the physical properties are. Then Britt, later in this series, will talk specifically about how we characterize near-Earth asteroids and what we need to know from the point of view of planetary defense. I have said repeatedly that we're interested in defending the Earth from near-Earth asteroids, and that the asteroid impact hazard is the only natural hazard, that we think, that could, in principle, be eliminated. We could develop the technology not only to find these objects and track their orbits, but to change the asteroid orbit. Imagine that you've predicted at some time in the future that the asteroid and the Earth will be in the same place at the same time. Earth moves its own diameter along its orbit in about six minutes. So you either have to move the Earth away from this rendezvous point or move the asteroid away. I think you would all recognize that it's easier to change the orbit of the asteroid than the orbit of the Earth. So if you can either speed it up or slow it down, 
that is apply force along the trajectory, either one way or the other, and change its arrival time by six minutes, it'll miss the Earth. There have been several technologies proposed, and we will be talking about those later in the series, for changing the orbit. Uh, the simplest, surely, is the ballistic impact. That is the equivalent of what NASA's deep impact mission did uh, with a comet, is you simply send a rocket at high speed and hit it. Again, pushing it either forward along its orbit or back and change its orbit that way. And, and if you can't do it in one hit, do it in two or three uh, until you've moved its orbit enough that it will miss the Earth. But there are other possibilities. The gravity tractor is a very sophisticated idea for moving objects, small amounts, but with high precision. Nuclear explosives have been suggested either to deflect the object or to destroy it. Note that one of the advantages of all three of these approaches, ballistic impact, gravity tractor, and nuclear, is you don't have to know a whole lot about the asteroid. To some degree, the efficacy of those approaches is independent of whether the asteroid is a rubble pile or a solid piece of rock or whatever. Always, I come back to the same thing, the key to any defense effort is early detection. The longer in advance you know, the better. There's a problem here, though. Even if we discovered one long in advance, how accurately can we predict that it will hit? If we knew it was going to hit 10, 20 years in the future, then I'm sure we would put together the resources to, to deal with it. But what if it has a 10% chance of hitting? Or a 20% or a 1%? What is the threshold at which the nations of the world would take action? In terms of a strategy, this is purely my own personal opinion. I think probably up to 100 meter size. We might, in some cases, just take the hit. If it was going to go into the ocean or in a completely unpopulated area like the Tunguska impact in, uh, in Siberia, uh, we could evacuate the people that were there and, and just let it happen, perhaps. I don't know where that threshold is. Um, if it's big enough, though, almost surely it would risk damage on a global scale and we would feel an obligation to try to deflect it. Now, since we haven't found this million objects out there, I have to say that no matter how hard we work, the most likely impact event in the next couple of decades would be a strike without prediction or warning, just like the Chelyabinsk meteor. And uh, we have to understand that and recognize that we aren't yet in a position to find and deflect every incoming object. But we certainly can focus on trying to find the big ones that could do the most damage. There are a lot of issues in planetary defense, and we will be discussing them later in this series. Uh, for instance, should we develop a system now? Should we develop or wait until there's actually a threat? Um, should it be an international effort? Well, most people would say yes. But how does that work? Does uh, all the countries in the UN contribute a little money to developing such a system? How much should we spend, especially now? when we have not identified a particular target. And who can be trusted? A lot of people would say no one country, including the US, can do this. Uh, and uh, we should not have control over the issue of whether an object will hit France or Germany, for instance. So there's an international aspect that is being developed through the UN. The UN's been studying planetary defense for more than a decade. Uh, the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Space meeting in Vienna has accepted that an international warning network be set up and a planning advisory group. Um, the reason Lindley Johnson is not here to give the talk today is he was just in Vienna and, uh, and representing the U.S. there. The Europeans have established what they call a space situational awareness program. Uh, there is increased international activity, a lot of interest. So far, relatively little money spent, uh, and that again comes back to my fundamental question, should we spend money now when we may not need a defense program for decades? 
And if so, who will pay for it? Clearly, cosmic impacts are real. We've seen Tunguska, we've seen Chelyabinsk, uh, we've detected 10,000 near-Earth asteroids, um, and it's quite reasonable, I would say imperative, that we take this seriously and do something about it. For the big ones, if we can find them in time, we should try to deflect them. The consensus really doesn't exist on how to detect with the smaller, more frequent impacts, how we find them and how we should deal with them. Let me conclude. Why did the dinosaurs go extinct? They were big and strong and beautiful. You've all seen Jurassic Park, even pretty intelligent. They were widely distributed. They occupied environments all over the planet, on land and sea and air. They had ruled the world for more than 100 million years. So what did they do wrong to go extinct 65 million years ago? Well, they didn't have telescopes, and they didn't have a space program. We have the telescopes to find them, and we, in principle, have the space program that could deflect them. Another way of putting the same thought is asteroids are nature's way of checking on our space program. I thank you for your attention, and uh, note that there will be a long series of these, uh, these just coming up, and we're going to look at the near-Earth asteroids and defending the Earth against asteroids from a variety of perspectives. But thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we really appreciate your talk. That was absolutely fascinating. We have uh, quite a few questions in the chat box. And so uh, bear with me. If I miss your question, I will go back and try and catch it. But uh, David, here are some of the ones that people have submitted. <clears throat> OK, we have a question that says, since different objects entering the atmosphere behave differently, do these hazard plots <clears throat> make distinctions between them in terms of damage inflicted, such as an object exploding at altitude versus a metal object that comes to the ground? The answer is yes. Those plots were talking about stony objects, uh, which are by far the majority, as we know from, from meteorites. There are very few cometary objects that are icy. Uh, that come into the inner solar system that could hit us, and there are relatively few metallic objects. Um, but ultimately, the risk comes from the energy, at least for a bigger object. Uh, an object, say, a kilometer in diameter, it will do the same damage whether it's rock or iron or ice. So uh, yes, we're biased toward rocky objects, but most of what I say could apply independently of whatever the composition was. Great. And could you please point out the difference between docking, <coughs> excuse me, docking and landing on an asteroid? A very small asteroid uh, <coughs> probably has such low gravity that you couldn't land. In fact, people looking at astronaut visits to asteroids have noted that uh, it's more analogous to maneuvering around the space station than to landing on the moon. But none of the things I've talked about involves docking or landing. We are talking about remote operations, uh, maybe moving it by impacting it with something. Uh, there are not going to be humans involved. We are not going to do as they do in the movies, I'm sure, and send a human crew to go out and try to deflect an asteroid. OK. And it looks like, uh, although Lindley was traveling from Vienna, he was probably able to make it at least to Washington, DC la last night, because he's joined us. And he addressed one of the questions. The question was, did the impactor on deep impact measurably alter the orbit of Temple 1? And Lindley writes that deep impact did not appreci appreciably alter Temple 1's orbit. This was a science mission and done in such a way as to minimize the effect on the comet's orbit. And I should add that the comet target was much larger than the asteroids we're talking about. Uh, you know, you, if you have to have a proportionate amount of impacting mass for the size of the object uh, to change its orbit. OK, great. We have another question. It says, how are these percentages determined? How do we know we found 94% of a population we do not fully know? I am so glad to have that question. How do we know what we don't know? And the answer is, assuming that asteroids, near-Earth asteroids, have, have statistically mixed up orbits, as they do. They go, uh, there's no concentration of them in one place or another. 
then you determine how complete you are simply by comparing in a survey program how many new objects you find relative to how many that you are, you are rediscovering that we already know about. So when Space Guard started, essentially every asteroid it found was new. Now we are at a point where, at least for the large, larger ones, the one kilometer or larger, uh, only one in 20 of those that are discovered are new. That tells us we're 95% of the way to completion. Very good. Okay. Would a survey telescope on the far side of the moon have any significant advantages over an Earth-based or orbit-based survey instrument? I don't think so. Uh, what you want is, is very broad sky coverage, and it's an advantage to be away from the Earth or moon. And you don't point toward the sun, and in fact, if uh, you wouldn't want to point toward the Earth or moon either. And so I think uh, an Earth orbit or a heliocentric orbit uh, out in space is the best and most efficient way to do it. Okay, and I believe there was even a comment in the chat box that I've missed uh, where somebody answered that question as well. Uh, I think here it is. Uh, we've got uh, a response that says, better than the far side of the moon would be a telescope in a Sun-Earth L1 halo orbit like SOHO, but looking back around the Earth continuously rather than at the Sun as SOHO does. It could find all objects approaching the approximate, from approximately the direction of the sun, like Chelyabinsk, uh, that all observatories on Earth would miss. That's a that's a good point. Uh, I will say that I am am biased toward the idea in a survey that you find things with long lead times. Uh, Chelyabinsk was coming from the direction of the sun this time, but the last time it came by the Earth, it wasn't. And so, if you're dealing with long lead time, you don't have to worry about looking toward the sun or not seeing things. That is only an issue if you're really trying to catch them on their final death plunge in toward Earth. And that's not, for the most part, what we're talking about. OK, here's a question. It says, uh, do we have the delivery systems for a kinetic impact gravity tractor and nuclear to get out to the target? That's a good question. Do we have the delivery systems? Well, we have a, a fleet of fairly large rockets. Uh, and we could certainly put uh, uh, the right upper stages on a uh, Falcon or a Atlas or, or a Delta and do it. We, can, we send spacecraft routinely to the planets. We do not have anything configured specifically for defense. And so that's why I say we have the technology, but we don't have a program. We don't have anything ready to go. If we were given decades of warning, I'm sure we could do it. If we were given 10 years warning, then we probably say, uh, we don't, we aren't ready. Okay. The Brown survey goal was greater than 140 meters uh, for NEOs. Do you think this is in need of revision? Uh, for instance, maybe a hundred greater than 100 meter potentially hazardous asteroids. That's a very good question. And again, it depends on how much money you want to spend. Yes, I would like to find 90% of the objects larger than 100 meters. Uh, but we're not going to do that with the kind of telescopes we're using today. We may get to the 140 meter with telescopes like PanStars in Hawaii. But if we want to go down to 100 meters, then we almost surely need a really big telescope like LSST or better yet, uh, an infrared detection system in space. Okay, and this looks like a partial comment. It says all optical observatories, but what about NEOWISE in the IR? NEOWISE is the, uh, the WISE mission, which was an astrophysics mission, which has been uh, used also very cleverly by folks at JPL uh, to look for the infrared from near-Earth asteroids. It is the first space infrared system. Uh, however, it's quite small aperture, and so it's not yet competitive with even our ground-based telescopes in terms of the the number of objects it's discovering. It's making a real contribution, uh, but it's not making our step up to a, a really more powerful system that I'm sure many of us would like to do. And I think that's uh, connected to this other question, which is just said, what are the optimal characteristics of a space-based telescope system? There have been several studied. Uh, it's probably something like a half meter diameter. 
uh, operating in the thermal infrared. Uh, it doesn't require need active cooling. You can do it passively uh, because you can observe these objects in the, the five micron region. And uh, shielded from the sun and a fast data rate because the discovery rate would be remarkable. If you can believe projections on something like the Sentinel, uh, it could be finding 50,000 near-Earth objects a year. Now, it's a projection. You don't know if it really will. But that's a lot of data that has to be absorbed in orbits that have to be calculated. It's not just the telescope in space. It's the ground-based systems for analyzing orbit calculation. Everything would have to be sped up relative to what we're doing now. And I've noticed that people are asking whether or not uh, the slides from this talk will be available. And the answer is yes. Uh, everything will be posted. The, the entire talk will be archived uh, as well on the survey.nasa.web.gov uh, website. Sorry. And we have a couple more questions. Let me see what else has come in. OK. Since meteorites may be a close cousin to 10 to 20 meter objects hitting the Earth, what about a different approach? an improved survey of orbits of incoming meteors or meteorites to determine their likely source, whether they're NEAs versus main belt versus others. Well, that, that's an interesting question. It has a variety of, of ways to look at. Absolutely, meteorites are samples of near-Earth asteroids. We have something like 40,000 meteorites sampling more than 1,000 different objects. Um, only in a few cases have been been able to measure the incoming uh, trajectory with enough to determine the orbit. What we've concluded is that they come from all over. The near-Earth asteroids are a very jumbled up collection. They are not left over from the original formation of the solar system. That is not in place. They've come from out in the main asteroid belt. Uh, they're deflected into the inner solar system. They interact gravitationally with the planets here. And that's really where most meteorites come from. They're not straight from the asteroid belt. They've gone through this intermediate uh, process of orbit modification. So you can't tell that much about exactly where they came from. OK. What do you think are the major challenges in aerospace engineering that we have yet to conquer uh, for asteroid defense? Hmm. I think, and this may sound insensitive, I think our main challenge is the money. I don't think we are talking about anything here that, uh, that goes beyond our current technology. Now, I don't know much about the nuclear options for deflection or blowing up an object. And that may need considerable work. And I'm simply not part of the, uh, uh, the nuclear science uh, and, uh, and weapon system labs that I would know how much it would take to, uh, to develop a nuclear option. Uh, OK, here's another one. What do you think about saving the Earth from NEAs by nuclear bombs? I guess that's exactly what you mean. Well, yes. Um, there's a wide range of opinion. Uh, but I think most of the scientists I know feel that that would be a, a last resort approach you would do something like kinetic impacting first and try to make that work. And one reason is simply that at least with the current political agreements, we can't test a nuclear system. We're not allowed to launch a nuclear explosives into space. And so I would think the much more straightforward approach, the much easier approach of kinetic impact would be certainly what we would, we would favor if we could, if there were time enough. How did data from Chelyabinsk uh, affect our estimates of the frequency at which NEA impacts occur with Earth? You can't develop, you can't understand the frequency from a unique event. That's the only 20 meter object that we've observed entering the atmosphere. So it really doesn't tell us anything. It, uh, some people said, oh, well, we didn't expect one. But of course, we didn't. You never expect the one. And so I don't think it, it helped us understand the frequency. It did two things. It was a wake-up call for the world. And it's led to a very interesting debate at what size do we worry? Do we worry in general about a 20-meter object? Uh, it didn't kill anybody. It came right over a, a very big city. 
Um, what is the threshold? Is it 30 meters? Is it 40? At what size would we really worry if we discovered an object that big headed for the Earth? Okay, uh, let's see. Would it make sense to put a, tel a space telescope in a close sun orbit? Uh, for example, a telescope orbiting the sun at about 0.3 AU. Pointing this kind of telescope towards the opposition point would allow us to detect inner Earth objects. As far as I know, only 12 inner Earth objects are known so far. Only 12 inner Earth objects are known. I don't know if that number is right, but the message it gives me is there aren't very many. I mean, I don't think there's some some large number hidden. If there is, they are not going to hit the Earth. There are things that are exclusively inside, of great scientific interest, perhaps. But from the point of view of defense, we're only interested in asteroids whose orbits cross the orbit of the Earth. And we can see those pretty well from Earth. Uh, we can look you know, sideways toward the sun. We can all see the planet Venus, and it never gets more than 47 degrees from the sun. Uh, but an inner heliocentric orbit like the one proposed for Sentinel at uh, near the orbit of Venus is good because that now can see anything external to Venus. And that pretty much covers any possible dangerous asteroids for Earth. Right. Okay, good. And there was a comment to that effect as well. Okay, an IR telescope allows much better estimation of size than an optical, or than optical albedo. Absolutely. Uh, asteroids are generally dark. A lot of them are as dark as a lump of coal. So when you see, measure their brightness in an optical telescope, you don't know how big they are. They could be uh, big and dark or smaller and brighter. Um, but if you look in the infrared, where you're just getting the heat radiation from it, it's more nearly proportional to the actual size of the object. And if you can get both infrared and visible, then you can tie down its size accurately. Okay, and a provocative question. Are we willing to ask the question, do we pool world resources in order to save a city or a narrow region 20 years from now? Well, <laughs> that's why the UN and the international folks are coming in. It, it's Right now, it's abstract in a sense. We don't know of any asteroid headed for the Earth, and it could come in anywhere. So we're all equally at risk, and there's a strong international issue. Suppose we did discover one and found out it was going to hit Siberia or, or Africa or somewhere. Um, how would we have the same attitude? Would, would all the countries of the world pull together uh, to save people in Africa? I mean, it's, uh, it's an complicated international question, and I'm very glad the UN and, and many nations are at least thinking about it, because someday we are going to have to defend ourselves from an incoming asteroid, and we should think these through in advance. Okay, I'd like to go back to one of the points you made where you said all three uh, of the possible ways of, of dealing with an incoming asteroid were independent of what the asteroid is made of for the most part, and I can see that for the tractor kind of idea, but if you're actually going to blow it up or, or do something to damage it, uh, doesn't it matter whether or not it's a rubble pile, or don't we need to know more about its composition? You're absolutely right, but none of the things that I was suggesting involves blowing up the asteroid. Okay. I'm not saying it might not be possible, and if you blew it up a long way from the Earth so that the fragments were dispersed, it's uh, you know what I would call a deflection by destruction. But I was assuming that we were just going to do simple mechanical things, either the gravity tractor or run a spacecraft into it. And uh, it depends somewhat, its response depends somewhat on what it's made of and so on, but, but not too much. Okay. okay. Is that it? It, uh, I see a, uh, a couple more people are typing. Um, okay, we have a question here in the room. Sure, David. So just to follow on with your UN comments and international politics, perhaps, or policy, say that there was an asteroid headed for London, for example, and you said that the Earth passes its own diameter every six minutes. So you could either speed it up by six minutes, slow it down by six minutes, or plus or minus three, however you want to look at it. And say you sped it up, it would then go over Moscow, for example. Mm -hmm. Or you slowed it down, it would go over Washington, D.C. Do you see any way of... of doing those international politics such that one country would have a better or more vested interest than another, or should it all be equal and we do what we can to avoid the risk? 
Well, uh, I can't dictate the politics of one country relative to another. Those are precisely the questions that people are looking at and do game theory and so forth to see what would happen. Uh, but uh, I would like to think that, that we would want to deflect an incoming object whatever country it was headed for. Whether that will be the case in reality, I don't know. Okay, and I'd just like to... Oh, excuse me, let me add one more thing to that. Okay, suppose it is headed for London, and we decide to move it, you know, the six minutes plus a minute, and our rocket fails to do that much, and it's accidentally moved over Moscow, and then the thing fails. You know, if, if the countries that have done the pushing, whether it was intentional or not, would take the blame for having put another country at risk. It's, it's tricky. It is tricky. So a little uh, closer to home, Lindley tells us that for those wondering, he did get into Washington, D.C. last night due to the efforts of an intrepid uh, uh, shuttle van driver, uh, but it still would have been very challenging for him to give this talk today, so he thanks you very much, David, for switching places with him. And well, thank you, Lindley, and we will look forward to your talk in two weeks. Yeah. And then Paul Chodas from JPL. Alan Harris, who's an expert on the populations, Dan Britt on physical properties, and other speakers following them. So everyone, I hope, will come to these talks. It's fun. Yes, thank you very much. From Survey Central, we're happy to have had you today, and everything will be posted on our website momentarily. We hope you enjoyed today's talk, and we thank you, David Morrison, very much for this wonderful kickoff to NASA's Asteroid Grand Challenge seminar series. We'll see you on February 28th. Bye-bye.